Hello YouTube, my name is Zach, and today is going to be the final episode of the Mike Patton 1K subscriber series. First off, I want to thank all of you so much for helping me get to this point with, with a thousand subscribers. It's unbelievable to me, and I just can't wait to see where this channel goes from here. I had no idea going into making this channel that this was going to happen. Um, it's crazy considering that this all started because I made a comment on a James Labrie video. Um, thank you so much for showing interest in, in this stuff. I, I had no idea that there would be, you know, a thousand or more people that would, you know, get online and sit through 30 minutes of me talking about stuff like this. So it's a really heartwarming and it, it makes me feel like I have a, a unique purpose compared to how things were before this channel started like six months ago. So thank you so much. And, and I hope that this, that this series has been informative and entertaining and maybe giving you guys some perspective on the the mad genius that is Mike Patton. And on that note, not a huge introduction today. Um, I'm going to be doing a Q&A after this analysis. This video is pretty short, so stick around after the analysis is over for the Q&A. Uh, some of the questions came from the Discord channel and a couple of other sources, so I'll tell you a little, a little bit more about that once we get there. So this is Ti Offro da Bere, which is Italian for I'll buy you a drink, I believe. Now, disclaimer alert, disclaimer alert. I don't speak Italian. I am not a native Italian speaker. I'm, it's, not even a, I'm, it's not even a second language. The only reason I'm even familiar with other, other languages at all is through college uh, when we learn IPA, International Phonetics Alphabet, and I've had to sing in lots of languages. I probably sung in Italian more than any other language in college. So that's the extent of my experience as to how to pronounce and you know speak the Italian, make the Italian sound and sing the Italian sound. Uh, I am not going to be very good at determining his phrasing, like how well he pronounces certain words in comparison to like the modern approach to speaking Italian. So all of my uh, insights are going to be based upon how I learned to sing in Italian. And a lot of what I'm going to be doing is comparing what I've learned about the Italian approach to vocalization with what Mike Patton is actually doing in this video. And the song isn't incredibly long. It's pretty short. I think it's a pop song in Italy. So it's pretty short. Uh, and after that, we'll move into the Q&A. So here we go. Let's, uh, let's get this thing started. <laughs> Vieni, che ti offro da bere Vieni, questa è l'ultima volta Che siamo insieme e parliamo di noi So the first thing to point out here is that this is a cover of a song by another singer. I believe it's like a, a classic Italian pop song or popular song. Uh, and Mike Patton, in this concert, he does like a, a compilation of, of popular Italian songs. Um, and so I'm not terribly familiar with the modern approach to singing Italian music. Um, I know that most of what we have developed in the study of the voices come from the Italians. That's where a lot of the, the modern like bel canto or beautiful singing approach originated it origi originated in italy now there have been other countries of course that have done their their branches of vocal study you know germany was really huge there are various areas of study in england where they had their own approach but italy is kind of like the heart of it all and and it goes all the way back to you know the, the renaissance and baroque eras where a lot of the early concepts of, of beautiful singing or bel canto de were developed and and kind of built upon. And one of the foundational kind of uh, groundwork concepts of bel canto singing was that you always look for a legato sound. And by legato, I'm talking about a smooth and connected sense of line throughout the singing. And if you've watched my videos in the past, you've seen me refer to line and legato uh, a few different times on, on several different occasions with different singers. And so the way that you can listen for a legato sound is is when you pay attention to the way the vowels are sung. So if you listen to how elongated the vowels are in each word, that kind of determines how legato a sound is. If the vowel seems to carry all the way through up until the beginning of the next word, that's a legato sound. And if not, it's a non-legato sound. So uh, in this case, I would say that generally speaking, Mike is using a non-legato sound. If you go back and listen to the clip, you'll hear that his words are kind of disjunct and he's kind of cutting each vowel off. Now, again, I don't know much about modern Italian music, 
But if you take the fundamental like bel canto principles where this all you know started and originated, it, it kind of defies some of that. And, you know, of course, we've talked about it. And as you all seen in the prior videos, Mike has never been one to follow the rules. And he is an Italian speaker. He either lived there or had a fiance or girlfriend or something who lived there. And so he learned Italian fluently. So he clearly knows how to speak the language. Um, now, from my understanding of it, I think that he uses some slightly Americanized pronunciations throughout this performance. And if I hear any of them that are obvious, I, I will point them out for you. And by the way, if there are any of you who are native Italian speakers who have anything to add to my commentary here, please feel free to, because since, you know, I, this isn't my native language, I can only do so much analysis of it, but I would love to hear your insights as to his pronunciations and the, how, how close what he's doing is to the way that more modernized Italian singing is, is approached. Um, but I would say that generally across the board, his sound is non legato because his because his vowels are not connected together very consistently and evenly. Uh, and it, it could just be his sound. It could be the way that the sound the song is supposed to be sung. Either way, it doesn't fit the criteria of that original like Italianate bel canto method of singing. Boy, sarà quel che sarà. So here you just heard him sing poi. Sara quel che sarà, right? So the words for that are basically, that basically means like, you know, and whatever is, is, or whatever will be, will be, something along those lines. It's like a, a loose translation of it. Um, but if you listen to the way that he approached the phrase, when he sung boy, he kind of goes poi. And I don't think that that's exactly correct in terms of pronunciation. I've always been under the impression that when you have two vowels beside one another, it's boy and you de-emphasize the E on the back end, I'm not going to try to super analyze his, his, you know, his uh, pronunciation because I might be incorrect, but I think that that's slightly inaccurate. Um, but it, the more important thing here is that when you listen to the way that he delivers the sound, it's very off the voice. It's poi. He kind of puts a lot of um, breath over it. That also is a concept that generally is against the, the, the common sort of bel canto concepts of singing because one of the core facets of bel canto singing is that you sing on the voice with a, a an honest sound in other words a sound that that is true to your own voice that isn't manipulated or manufactured and so putting air over the sound or covering the sound would be an example of manufacturing it so that wouldn't exactly fit into bel canto principles either and when he sings sara at the end you hear him go saraha he kind of does this aspirate h in the middle and we actually alluded to that in the mr bungle video where that's something that i guess he's just developed uh, as an affect of his singing sound is to put that aspirate h in the middle of his sound so um you you know, again, if you if you are of Italy and you know how this type of thing is sung, please let me know if that's you know t typically considered acceptable. Uh, but in terms of bel canto singing specifically, you would not hear someone go saraha with an H in the middle of it on the vowel. It disrupts the purity of the vowel, and it at most at most of the time when you're singing in Italian, the vowels are very pure. Like for example. Um, we English speakers have a hard time of it when we learn to sing in Italian because the vowel pronunciations are so inherently simple. Uh, you know, we, we don't even use the same symbols for the sound. So for us, our I, E, A, O, and U to them would be E, E, A, O, and U. So we have a very different way of pronouncing vowels. And so it wouldn't surprise me if uh, Mike isn't Americanizing this to some extent. And he, if, it, if he weren't taking some of these more like Italian based singing principles in what he's doing. <laughs> So all those things where he's like really, where he's doing that, where he's really closing up, that is affecting his legato as well. So yeah, absolutely. Um, he's not taking a bel canto approach. That much can, is, is, you know, to be, to be certain. He's doing a very nice job of the Italian vowels though, from what it, from what it, uh, it seems. It's just the only thing I see is that sometimes he's doing this closing thing where he's, he's, he doesn't let the vowel itself sing. And that's a concept that can be applied to, to any style, any language, any genre. 
you typically want to let your vowels sing more. I feel like this type of analysis is a little bit more merited in this style of singing compared to the things that we did in the prior videos, because this is more traditional. These songs are more traditional. So more traditional singing concepts could apply. He's not doing anything unhealthy that I can hear. It's just unrefined and he's not letting his voice sing the way that it could up to this point when he closes off on his vowels too much. <laughs> So that was a super wide embouchure for an eh vowel. Uh, typically, when you when you sing an eh vowel, you don't have to eh, you don't have to do that kind of thing. And most of the time, it affects the sound of the vowel and makes it much wider. Like, if, for example, if I go eh and then I go eh, you can hear the difference in the, in the two vowel sounds. And th that reflected a little bit in what he sung. But for the most part, you know, just singing on an eh vowel, you don't have to open your mouth that much. So just a little bit of a drop of a jaw to a you know, slightly more open than neutral state will work. Um, I don't really know why he would choose to do that here. I don't know if it's like some sort of affect with the word that he's singing or what it would mean or anything like that. I'm, I'm not sure. But, but you definitely don't have to open your mouth that much when you sing an eh vowel. So one thing that I learned in college is that a lot of the early Italian art song came from poetry and stories that had these almost overly embellished concepts of love and missing the lover or pining after the one that you want and and not being able to have them or missing them, that, that kind of thing. And it was extremely... Uh, melodramatic like uh, there was a lot of like oh well I should just end my life if my love doesn't come to me kind of concepts in a lot of this this early Italian music and so when you look at the text and the translation effectively what this song is about is saying like let's have a drink let's share the memories of old and let's let's like reminisce so that I can see that you're walking away from me and that you're not going to be here anymore. The text kind of has this comparison of the singer saying like, I want to believe that none of this is true. I want to believe that none of this is real, that you're still my love and you're still the one that, that is here for me, but you want it to be the other way. And so I have to accept that. And that's sort of like, well, chiaro scuro, light versus dark thing is an extremely common theme in Italian literature, in Italian art, in Italian music, going back historically, I mean, it always has been, is sort of the foundation. So I say all that to say that I think that Mike is trying to create a sort of juxtaposition in his singing sound. And I didn't think this 15 minutes ago when I started this analysis, but upon, I've already, I've reviewed this video once, but now looking on it again, I think that some of these lines where he's talking like about realizing that, that, his partner's gone, he's covering his sound. He's creating this more like um, airy, wispy quality to, to almost sound like he's reminiscing or, or longing. Um, because it makes sense when you, if it's a lot easier if you follow it along with the text when you look at this. So what I would recommend that you do is uh, in your own time, if you want to watch this particular video, I would look it up and follow along with the translation so you can kind of see these points because I think that there might be a little bit more nuance and artistry going on in what Mike is doing with his expression in his voice than I originally gave him credit for. And it would make sense that he, since he knows the language and I don't, um, he may be using a little bit more artistry than I, than I initially thought. The, the thing is, there are ways to create artistic sounds without resorting to unhealthy habits. Like, for example, when you cover the sound and you do everything like this, then essentially what happens is you're keeping your chords from closing. I mean, I've been over this a hundred times in videos in the past, but there are other ways to create that same degree of artistry or that same like disconnected sound. You can just literally hold the sound further back in your head. You can um, go down a few dynamic levels and, and use a little bit more head voice in the sound. Those are ways that you can keep the sound softer or more, more uh, contemplative without having to just cover the sound up. And that's a big mistake that I think a lot of singers make. I think that they, they defer to covering the sound when they want to say something that's sad or, or particularly meaningful or what, what have you, instead of staying on the voice and doing things that keep the chords closed. And so, you know, I don't necessarily think that, that 
Mike is in the wrong to do what he did. I just think that there was a healthier way he could have done it. And it doesn't matter what the language is, and it doesn't matter, you know, what the context is. It, it, anytime you cover the sound by pushing more air through, it keeps the, the folds from closing, and it's less healthy than if you found another alternative that keeps the cords more closed. For me, So at this point, this is basically just speak singing. This is a very Broadway concept where you focus more on the creation of the text and the, the tones or the pitches are secondary. Um, there isn't a lot of necessary technique involved when you do this. It's not like when you use speak singing, you're going to be focused on laryngeal positioning and things like that. It, it doesn't really apply in that way at all. You're really just speaking and then when you find an elongated word you use the appropriate pitch you hear this a lot in broadway this is one of the the reasons and i before i say this i don't necessarily agree with this this is just a sentiment that some of the people in the opera realm have some some people in opera think that musical theater isn't legitimate i totally disagree totally disagree i didn't come up with that idea but they think that musical theater isn't legitimate because there are so many times where they can just rely on speak singing rather than actually singing and so you know, it's it's a different way of looking at it, and I think it's a little bit too harshly judgmental, and I think it, it, it kind of takes away from the talents that musical theater performers actually have. Like, there's a much greater emphasis on acting in musical theater than there is in opera, I believe. So, um, you know, I, I don't think it's a completely fair argument, but that's kind of where the idea comes from. And it, it's uh, speak singing in some circles is viewed as a negative thing because it doesn't require as much musicianship. But the, what that does on the flip side is the barrier of entry for singing to get into something like musical theater is much lower. You don't have to be an incredible singer to break the wall into musical theater. Whereas you aren't going to get into an opera company if you don't have chops. It's just how it is. So it's just two different sides of the same coin, in my opinion. They're both on stage performing. They just emphasize two different things. Okay, just as a general rule, this doesn't really have anything to do with Mike singing here. Try not to whisper very much because whisper is just creating pressure that pushes through the folds and engages the mechanism while deliberately keeping the folds separated. Anytime you do that, it can cause muscle tension dysphonia, which is like you know, like strain on the exterior muscles. If you even put a little bit of sound on the whisper, you're trying to force the cords to close when they don't want to in a whispered kind of configuration. Don't whisper. It's generally very bad for you. So that was a very nice oval. Um, it didn't look like his embouchure was rounded in the traditional O sense, but the 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 resultant tone was completely fine. It was a very even and consistent tone, and I'm surprised that he didn't uh, put some vibrato on it there because it sounded like the the folds fully closed and they wanted to vibrate. I don't know if he deliberately like like tightened things up so it didn't vibrate or if he just didn't actually have vibrato there. I don't know, but it, the way that the, the sound came out made me think that it should have had some vibrato on it. Boy, come on, boy, it so here you're starting to hear kind of a deeper resonance, kind of a more... Um, a fuller sound. This is coming from a lowered larynx, back of the mouth resonance sound. So this is kind of a good comparison from what he was doing earlier. And even if you listen to the sounds that he was making in the in the first video when he was with Faith No More, it's kind of a, a total transition of the way that he's approaching vocalization. Whereas earlier in his career, he seemed to really stuff things up in the face a lot. It seems like if you take some of that later stuff from Mr. Bungle, like the Air Conditioned Nightmare, and even into this, which is just from like five or six years ago, um, it's it's really starting to show that he's moved his sound generally further back. And it makes sense because the more you push sound up into the front of your face, the more you have to have high larynx engagement, generally speaking, most of the time. And as a result, you end up um, really hurting yourself more in the long run. And so maybe he made some adjustments as he aged because he saw that the ways that he was doing things weren't the ways that he was singing and doing things wasn't quite as sustainable. And I mean, if anyone can say they've had a successful career because of the adjustments he's made, it would be Mike Patton because he's still singing with, you know, like there's no tomorrow and 
His voice is still in relatively good shape. I mean, he's not doing the crazy high-pitched squealing that he was doing in his 20s, but I don't think that could be expected of anyone. Once your once your larynx gets past a certain point of hardness, I don't think that anybody could scream like that after a certain point. I mean, I could be wrong, and I'm sure there are exceptions to the rule that could prove me wrong, but but you can see that he's made a lot of adjustments to his approach to singing in these more dramatic sections as his voice has matured, which is a very reasonable and smart decision to make, in my opinion. <laughs> So you, it's hard to see for the microphone, but I don't hear anything that suggests that his embouchure was too far wide. His E was a, the E vowel was a little bit abrupt and it did seem like he pushed a little bit, but I don't think that the embouchure was too wide because it would have taken on this more like E kind of sound than E. And I know that's subtle, but if you listen to the difference of E and E, there's a slightly darker tinge on the more vertically aligned vowel, which was the second one of the two that I did. Uh, I really like how he took the O uh, before the O-E that, on that like vowel transition. When he took the O and he kind of closed it a little bit, you could hear how it moved up and the, that vowel was very clean, had a very nice sense of resonance. Um, and then it converged into that E. It kind of elided into the E vowel and it, it just made a really nice sound, a nice phrase. So good stuff. Um, generally speaking, I think that Mike Patton has shown that he can do it all. And I know that... This analysis is probably wasn't the most uh, comprehensive as some of the other ones, but this is tough. I mean, analyzing Mike Patton is a challenge, and it, you know I've always taken the approach in this channel if you know how how it would be if someone came into my studio and took lessons or what have you. But with Mike's case, like I don't know what I would say because he just does so many things his own way, and there's not a whole lot that that. I could honestly say that I give him his pointers because he's just broken all the rules. At any rate, so I asked on a YouTube post for you guys to list me some questions. I didn't, I didn't get any questions there. I probably posted it too late. I did get some questions from my Discord server. You guys all should join the Discord server because it's uh, there's a lot of really good conversations that go on there. And it's like it's kind of become a small community and it's it's a lot of really good people and talked about a lot of cool, cool topics. And uh, they've asked me a lot of direct questions. So. I'm going to go down the list of some of the questions from the people in the Discord server gave me. It's like a little mini Q&A. This is sort of give you guys like a little mini thank you for all of the support. And maybe this will help you guys answer some questions that some of you may have had. Maybe some of the questions that were asked are questions that you might have that you didn't think of asking. So here we go. Question number one. What does singing on the breath imply? So singing on the breath is basically covering your sound. On the voice means that you're singing using the voice as the predominant resonator or the predominant thing that creates the sound so me speaking like this would be speaking on the voice but if i talk like this then i'm speaking on the breath singing on the voice um and off the voice are the same thing as like a covered versus a non-covered sound the terms are interchangeable question number two when will you do your next video on ronnie james dio okay so there's a there's a big answer to this but I'm going to try to keep it simple. I definitely plan on revisiting some of the singers I've already talked about. There are a few in mind that I specifically am really anxious to, to do. And I don't want to say because I don't want you guys to like think that it's happening in the next two weeks because it's not. I got a lot of other things coming on. But there have been some singers that because of some of the responses that I've gotten in the comments and from from some of the people uh, who you know who responded to the video... I'm a little bit reticent to analyze again, and Dio is one of them. Dio and Bruce Dickinson are two singers that I'm, I'm very uh, leery of, of going back into again. Um, if you take those two videos and the comments of them, and I've deleted a lot of these, well, all the really bad ones. I've gotten more, uh, more uh, commands to kill myself from those two videos combined than I've ever gotten in my entire life. So... Because of that, I'm not sure that I want to analyze Dio and or Bruce Dickinson again. Uh, <laughs> so maybe. I know that a lot of you are Dio fans, and I was thoroughly impressed by his singing. So I don't know I don't know where all that like malice and vitriol came from, but it makes me not want to do another Dio video. So I don't know. Maybe you guys can do enough selling. Maybe you can convince me to do another Dio video. We'll see. What are the voice differences between the sexes? Now, that is a question that's impossible to answer in a sentence or two. Um, the biggest difference, I would say, is the hardening of the larynx. For men, cartilage generally gets harder 
than it does for women. Uh, but the, the downside is that the more that cartilage hardens, the more brittle it becomes in age. And so women typically have shorter vocal peaks, but when their voice falls off, the state that it's in when it falls off stays that way effectively the rest of their lives, whereas men have much more sustained vocal peaks, but their fall-offs are drastic and fast, and they lose a whole lot more, which is why a lot of old men kind of carry, they have this kind of sound when they talk. That's just a sign of the larynx not being able to sustain that range of pitches that they create when they speak as much. So those, that's the biggest core difference, I would say. I mean, that's oversimplifying it. But but if I had to pick one thing that jumps out as a major difference between the sexes, that would be it. Draco Dan asks, what is your favorite color? Um, I've always been a fan of cool colors. Even when I was a kid, I loved blue and purple. And I still love those colors. But I think that green has kind of taken over as my favorite color as I've gotten older. Green, blue, and purple are my favorite colors, though. Have you had a voice student who has a unique timbre or perhaps different from their speaking voice? I've met a lot of people who seem to have a very different speaking voice, usually because they talk very low. So that's a multifaceted question. Um, yes, I have had students who have unique singing voices. Most of the time, it's a byproduct of the manufacturing something, whether they realize it or not. As far as the second half, where people speak very low and it sounds different from their, from their singing voice, I have a personal anecdote along with this that I've shared on this channel before. I had voice therapy while I was in college, and it turned out that I had developed some uh, like a divot on one of my vocal folds because I was using my voice too low. Uh, I, was, I was speaking too low, and I was overusing my voice. I was singing too much speaking too low and by doing so it was putting way too much weight on my folds so when i went through voice therapy they actually trained me to pitch my speaking up higher they helped me find my fundamental speaking frequency and try to stay on it more and after i did that my whole approach to singing and my everything about my voice improved a whole lot so um i would say that a lot of people who speak and overly low and their singing voice is higher usually are doing one of two things they're either speaking too low or they're singing too high. And the only way that you can really know, though, is if you go to a voice therapist. And I'm not a voice therapist. So um, I, I have had students who have had some things like, oh, I've done some similar voice therapy-ish techniques and exercises with them, and they've had some okay results. But I don't want to speak for voice therapists in that sense. I mean, it's, it's a case-by-case -case thing, and I'm no doctor. I might be a voice teacher, but I'm not a doctor, so I can't make all those types of assessments spot on all the time. Uh, Draco Dan also asks, I have a question that I think is pertinent, but maybe not appropriate for such a setting. Are there any singers you strongly dislike either because you hate their voice or their technique singers? You really just can't stand listening to. Oh boy. How many fans am I going to lose over this one? Um, I'm not a fan of that Patrick guy. I think Patrick Stump from Fallout Boy, not a fan. I don't mind their music. I think their music's well written. Like some of it, not all of it. Some of it's well written but I definitely don't like his singing voice. I don't like um, Tommy Rogers from Between the Buried and Me. Is that his name? Tommy Rogers? Yeah, I think it's Tommy Rogers. I don't like Tommy Rogers' voice. Uh, I think that he probably could have been a much better singer than he has been. Uh, I don't know what has caused him to have so much of his singing off the voice like he does, like his clean singing. Um, it could be that he doesn't really know another way to do it. It could be that he creates his harsh vocals in a way that covers the sound, so he just defaults to singing that way too. Uh, but I really don't like his singing voice. I like some of the Between the Bear to Me's music, don't get me wrong, but I definitely don't like his singing voice. And most female pop singers, I really don't like the way that most of them sing. Uh, I do like Kimbra, and I like St. Vincent, and... Um, and I am okay every now and then with, like, I don't know, Ariana Grande. I do like, I thought Mariah Carey was an excellent singer. But outside of them, I'm not a huge fan of many female pop singers. I think that most of them either sing way too low or they push their chest voice up far too high. And women's voices are very different in that it, it, it's exponentially more dangerous for women to push their chest voices up too far before moving in their head voice than it is for men. I mean, it's bad for men too, don't get me wrong, but it's exponentially worse for women. Um, 
and so I think a lot of a lot of female pop singers do that, and so I, I kind of uh, reprimand that. And those are all the questions that I got. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope that gave you a little bit of insight. If you have any more questions, let me know. I am going to be doing a live stream. Uh, look for it this Saturday. I'm probably going to do the live stream sometime around like 6 p.m. Eastern time this Saturday. So look out for that. Uh, and there are going to be some really cool things coming down the pipe. I'm going to be doing an interview with Ross Jennings of Haken and an interview with Einar Solberg of Leprous. As soon as they're done with their tour, they only have like four or five days left on the tour, and then they're going back overseas. So as soon as they get back overseas, they're going to do the interview with me. So it could be in the next few weeks. I'm not 100% sure. They, uh, they both said December around December. So uh, hopefully it'll be before then, but we'll see. I'm not going to pressure them. If not, um, look for some, some other stuff next week. I'm not sure what my next week's subject is going to be on. If you have any suggestions, believe me in the comments and I might consider something. I've actually been considering uh, talking about comparing the, the Nightwish singers, Tadia and uh, Floor Jansen. I've been thinking about doing that. So that might be coming next week. Uh, anyway, so I hope that I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. I do give voice lessons. You guys know that. Please like, please subscribe, all that good jazz that uh, helps my channel out. I do have a Patreon. I'll put the link in the description. And please feel free to join the Discord. There's a lot of great discussion in there, and you can have a, a direct interaction with me. So if you want to talk to me about this stuff, I'm more than willing to. So please feel free to join anytime. All right, so I'll see you all next week. Again, thank you so much for being my subscriber. I wouldn't have made this series if I hadn't gotten to a thousand. I got, I'm doing all this because of you all. And thank you so much for supporting me. It means more to me than you will ever know. Whoever you are sitting out there watching this video, it, it means so much. And I wish that I could find you and personally shake your hand and give you a hug or whatever and tell you thank you for it. So, I mean, I really mean it. And uh, I hope that uh, I hope that I continue to deliver content that makes you want to keep watching. So and you have, if you have any suggestions for me, please let me know. Leave them in the comments and we'll see where this channel goes from here. Thank you all so much. You have a good one. I'll see you next week. Bye.